But we're going to continue our study of 1 Corinthians. We're in the 10th session, and we're going to study chapter 11. So we'll have something to offend everyone. There's, everyone will have something in there that will disturb them a little bit. And uh, so, uh, as many of you know, I like to call the Corinthian letters the letters to the Californians, because California and Corinth had a lot in common. Both were very, very um, secular. Both were sin capitals of the respective communities. And both words became synonymous with fornication, strangely enough. And uh, so, but to, they also, uh, as we will see in this coming chapter, we're known for uh, uh, unruly meetings, and so we'll talk a little bit about that also. But before we start, let's do what we should always do. Let's bow our hearts for a word of prayer. Father, we thank you for who you are. We thank you for this coming hour. We commit this hour and ourselves into your hands in the name of Yeshua, our precious Redeemer indeed. Amen. Okay, so... This first verse is really a carryover from last time, where he says, Be ye followers of me, even as I also am of Christ. That really summarizes the previous session. But the next four chapters we're going to deal with will deal with worship in several forms. And so we'll just jump right in here in the second verse of chapter 11 of 1 Corinthians. Now I praise you, brethren, that ye remember me in all things, and keep the ordinances as I deliver them to you. Strange phrase, keep the ordinances. And uh, remember here, we're dealing with the multicultural society of Corinth. And we sometimes lose perspective. Corinth was a very uh, uh, metropolitan, uh, cosmopolitan area. And they had uh, uh, very diverse cultures there. And they come in conflict, of course, as we're going to be dealing here with some of the things here. The Corinthian women, by the way, had become emancipated in their view and began to flout established traditions and decorum even in that day. Uh, there, it, we've discovered inscriptions in Corinth that indicates that they, com they competed in the Isthmian Games, including war chariot races, 200 meter runs, and other things. So what we think of the Olympic Games, they had an equivalent kind of thing that, that Corinth became very famous for. But Paul continues, But I would have you know that the head of every man is Christ. And the head of it, the woman is the man, and the head of Christ is God. And here we have this term, the head, all the way through here. And uh, the, it, the divine pattern is in three clauses here, beginning and ending with Christ. Kephali, the head, the source, the authority. And that term is, Paul uses that phrase 17 times. Seven times literally and uh, ten times figuratively, and that'll all be in your notes. You can copy them out of there if you like. The Septuagint usage for Hebrew Rosh is the same uh, use, in effect, the chief or ruler is the concept there. And the Jewish perspective is both authority, uh, and uh, both source and authority. It's used two different ways, but in both cases they, it, it carries the same thought of chief or ruler or the head. Continue, he says, every man praying or prophesying, having his head covered, dishonoreth his head. He's going to make a contrast here between the man and the woman. The man who has his head covered is dishonoring his head. That may surprise you, because there are many groups that favor the man being have his head covered. But that's not what Paul is advocating here. See, the dress codes we're dealing with here vary from culture to culture and age to age. Paul was objecting to the blurring of genders desiring to demonstrate the clear distinction between men and women. That's what he's really after. God designed men and women differently, and Paul is celebrating the differences. And he's, try and, uh, he's, he's uh, objecting to blurring of genders, interestingly enough. And uh, we're going to discover when we get to chapter 14, the gift of prophecy evident. Uh, it seems that women had assumed certain privileges and positions of dominance, and we'll deal with that when we get to chapter 14. But... Uh, but remember, Joel predicted that your sons and daughters shall prophesy. So we should expect women to prophesy. There are some aspects to that we'll talk about when we get to chapter 14. But he's, that, that's a reality we need to uh, face right at the beginning here. And this term uh, that's in the Greek is having something down from the head is what it literally says. Those are the same words that the Plutarch used in, uh, in uh, um, his writings, from, and which was from Corinth. 
See, in their native land and in their colonies, Romans covered their heads during private and public devotions. Offering sacrifices or praying, they would pull their toga forward over their heads. That was the Roman practice. Okay? Praying uncovered fits the context of shunning the worship of idols. That may surprise you, but that was the, that's in effect what Paul is talking about. Covering the head was the Roman practice, and he was saying that a man should be praying with his head uncovered, strangely enough. And by the way, some scholars view the term as referring to an unmasculine hairdo, strangely enough, a possible reference to homosexuality, but not all uh, authorities agree on that. We'll move on, verse 5. But every woman that prayeth or prophesieth with her head uncovered dishonoreth her head. For that is even all one as if she were shaven. Wow. And so it's going to, it's interesting. Verse 4 and 5 of this chapter reveals the equality of women in the church. We're going to talk a lot about that in the next few chapters. But if the man, the man should be praying uncovered, the woman should be prayed with her head covered because that's honoring her head. Who's her head? Her husband. So when she prays uh, uncovered, she's rebelling against her husband is what it implies, according to Paul. In the Old Testament, it was the man who received the sign of the covenant in Genesis 17 and who served as a representative for the woman, for the women. And uh, in the New Testament, male and female are one in Christ. Different situation here. And uh, so, uh, if she has her head uncovered, she dishonoreth her head. The Corinthian woman, putting aside her head covering, that is her veil in, co in public, was a form of rebellion, renouncing her subordination to her husband, going against the structure of creation. That's Paul's perspective here. For if the woman be not covered, let her also be shorn. But if, it be a sh but if it be a shame for a woman to be shorn or shaven, let her be covered. And uh, so that's uh, the, uh, we could go on and on about that, but that's pretty straightforward. Shaving a woman's head was a form of humiliation for an adulterous woman. In Numbers 5, you can check that out if you like. Although the gospel sets people free from Jewish civil and ceremonial laws, it does not abrogate the distinctive roles for each gender and the husband and wife relationship. So on the one hand, we're not under the Jewish civil or ceremonial law, is fine. But what Paul is arguing for is to maintain the, the distinctive roles of the man and the woman as God designed them. And that's, that's his real issue here. He continues in verse 7. For a man indeed ought not to cover his head for as much as he is the image and glory of God. But the woman is the glory of the man. And that image and glory is interesting. That comes from the creation account, Genesis 1 and 2. It, it echoes this. The image, not the likeness, but the image of God, suggests an exact representation. That may surprise you. Because we often take that word image as just a likeness. No. And uh, glory rather than likeness is in Psalm 8 and verse 5. So it, the image and glory is the emphasis here by Paul. Why should a woman... Bring glory to her husband. Well, he's going to deal with that in the next two verses. For the man is not of the woman, but the woman of the man. Neither was the man created for the woman, but the woman for the man. That's his emphasis. And that's really what Paul is driving at here. The husband takes primary responsibility for his headship with a non-reversible orientation of the woman towards the man as the reference point in her life. And, P and uh, Timothy... Paul's protege in the second chapter of his first letter, uh, Paul's first letter to Timothy, deals with that. And uh, we'll deal with that some more before the series are over. For this cause ought the woman to have power on her head because of the angels? Wow, that's a, this is a strange one. Now, see, for this cause, he's tying this to the previous three verses. Okay, for this cause. What cause? The last three verses we've just read. For this cause, the woman ought to have power on her head because of the angels. Now, this is a very strange phrase, and there are many good scholars with different views on this, on this phrase. But it does seem that the holy angels are present 
whenever saints remember the Lord. We find that in other passages, 1 Peter and so forth. So there's something strange going on here. The portrayal we get from the scripture is that the angels are learning the plan of God by watching us. They study us to see how that's working out to infer what God is really up to, strangely enough. And so, uh, uh, but uh, the woman ought to have power in her head because the angels, that's part of it. It may go deeper than that. The rabbis have a strange, especially in Qumran, they had a strange view. They say an unveiled woman in a sacred assembly is like a bodily defect which should be excluded. And, and that's, their, that's a, just a rabbinical view. But there are some sources that link all of this idea to Genesis 6 and the strange goings on in Genesis 6. I'm not going to dwell on that here. I just call it to your attention and you can explore that on your own. On your own. And so, uh, okay. But he continues in verse 11, Nevertheless, neither is the man without the woman neither the woman without the man in the Lord. In other words, the Lord sees the man and the woman as a unit. They're more than just one flesh in the bodily sense. He sees them united. And uh, my wife and I have experienced that in some strange ways very recently, and I'll leave that for another time. But, but uh, clearly, the man is not without the woman, neither the woman without the man. They're together and, uh, and with Christ at the head. And in the Lord, Christianity has been and remains a force that liberates women from oppression and servitude. And that's, a, that's something many people don't realize. See, in many other religions, women are owned by their fathers or husbands, and they're treated as chattel or property. Islam is a, a painful example of that, strangely. And, uh, and the Jewish faith is not innocent here either. In, in the Jewish prayer, there's an 18 petition prayer where a man renders thanks to God for making him neither a slave, a Gentile, or a woman. So I'm not here to defend their particular expressions of that. But clearly, uh, the Lord Jesus Christ has really uh, put that uh, to rest, uh, behind us. And so, see, even in Israel, a woman, a female was a secondary to any male. Women were not considered worthy of studying the scriptures. They were, they were denied education. They were not even counted in the number required for a synagogue, which is a minimum of 10. They had to be 10 men, strangely enough. They're accepted that, obviously. So, now in the New Testament, that's, what we're, that's where we are now. There is a frequent edifying and mention of women, and their equality is noted in many ways, and we're going to dwell on that. And uh, that has some subtleties, but we want to really understand that. Paul continues here in verse 12, For as the woman is of the man, even so the man also by the woman, but all things of God. Now Paul is not trying to enforce the first century styles on the church. In contrast to Islam, which enforces the customs of 7th century Arabia on its followers. Paul is not doing that. Attendance at and participation in a service dedicated to worshiping God does require proper decorum. That's Paul's concern. It's interesting that even the angels, we find, covered their faces in God's presence. We see that in Isaiah 6, when Isaiah is treated to a, a visit to the throne room, and uh, the angels covered their faces in God's presence. So there's nothing demeaning about that. That's just part of what they see. In that day, women wore veils as marked distinction from men. God created a distinct difference between men and women, and he desires that his people mark this dissimilarity with appropriate dress. Not abiding by these dress codes negates the differentiation which God has designed. And so that's, that's Paul's message here. It isn't the particulars, it's maintaining the distinction between the men and the woman that he's, he's advocating. Judging yourselves. Is it comely? that a woman pray unto God uncovered. That's his challenge to them. Doth not even nature itself teach you that if a man have long hair, it is a shame unto him? The idea, though, is preserve the natural order of creation and avoid confusion. That's what Paul is arguing for. Even the Stoic Epictetus uh, taught in the second half of the first century speaks the need of the, to preserve the signs which God has given to avoid confusion in this regard. 
Jewish men cut their hair except during a stipulated period associated with a vow, if you, if you study that. Now, Greco-Roman practice also favored trimmed hair, except for certain exceptions like the Spartans in the Peloponnesian uh, Peninsula. To have long hair was considered shameful to them, to the man. That was the, the, the view in, in Greco-Roman practice. And uh, so, the cultural pattern in Israel was that a woman would not unloose her hair in public except to identify herself as a prostitute, strangely enough. And so, you may recall, of course, Simon the Pharisee was horrified when a prostitute ordered his, uh, entered his home and wiped Jesus' feet with her hair. But her hair coming down, was, was, that, was the, that was the implication of it, presumably. And so, uh, John MacArthur likes to point out that the, uni the unique beauty of a woman is gloriously manifest in the distinctive femininity portrayed by her hair and her attendance to feminine customs. Indeed, a, a woman is feminine to, to, uh, should celebrate her femininity. And covering hair, of course, alludes to an article of clothing such as veil. Paul wants a woman to be distinctively feminine and thus fulfill the role that God has intended since creation. That's pretty straightforward. And, uh, but we'll move on. Here. So he goes on in verse 15. But if a woman have long hair, it is a glory to her. For her hair is given her for a covering. So in Solomon is right too. In, in Song of Songs, you see that echoed uh, several times. But if any man seem to be contentious, we have no such custom, neither the churches of God. And I'm very intrigued with that, because remember in Proverbs 13, Solomon tells us, only by pride cometh contention. If there's contention, that source is always pride. That's one reason we don't advocate participating in debates. Many people want me to debate this or debate that. I usually don't want to. Because behind a debate is contention, and contention, the root of that is pride. If somebody has a sincere question, we try to answer it, but uh, not, not through contention. Contentious, that's one who loves to argue. Paul has not time for anyone whose mind is set on debating an issue for the sake of argument. Paul frequently refers to all the, the, to all the churches in the same regard, and there's a handful of verses you can check down, check out at your, at your leisure. But now the whole chapter, you girls can relax, we're off hairdos now, we're shifting to the Lord's Supper. The Lord's Supper is a topic that really dominates this chapter, and this is where we're headed now. This letter records the earliest records of the Lord's Supper. Paul's letter was probably written earlier than the Gospels. That may surprise you. It sure did we when I first ran into that. So let's pick it up in verse 17. Now in this that I declare unto you, I praise you not that ye come together, not for the better, but for the worse. Paul's going to hit it right up front that the problem in this area is that they're, they're regarding it without the solemnity it deserves. And so he's going to scold them and then explain it as we go here. There was frequently unseemly behavior at their gatherings. Some were left hungry. Some were even drunk in the so-called, as they were operating, the, using the Lord's Supper. This was not a love feast. He says, first, I love this. He says, first of all, when we come together in the church, I hear that there be divisions among you, and I partly believe it. <laughs> I love that. Now, this first place thing amuses me because here and elsewhere, Paul will say in the first place, and then he never goes on to talk about the second or third place. It's a phrase he throws in there, but he, he loses track of that, apparently. Uh, he never lists a single one after the first of all. But the worship services that we're dealing with here were generally held in private homes. Let's keep that in mind as we go. And, uh, and we need to do that more. And it's my suspicion that we're going to increasingly have to, that the kind of services that are public and large scale are going to be increasingly hostile to the biblical believer. That may surprise you. But that's what J. Vernon McGee predicted several decades ago. And that's also what the history that was documented by E.H. Broadbent in the Pilgrim Church reveals that the true believers since Acts chapter 2 on met in small groups in homes and were invariably attacked by the local churches rather than supported by them, surprisingly enough. But we'll go on here. During these gatherings, they read Paul's letters. Now, this is very surprising, but take this in. They read Paul's letters 
that were given canonical status equivalent to the Old, Test Test uh, Old Testament scriptures. In those home meetings, in that first century, they read Paul's letters and regarded them as if they were God-breathed. That may come as a surprise, but it's well documented. And uh, Peter makes reference to that, and others do too. So, we'll, mo we'll move on here. There were factions, of course. See, there are many different cultural, social, economic backgrounds represented in Corinth. Jews, Greeks, Romans, merchants, government officials, professionals living in spacious homes, as well as laborers and dock workers living in rented quarters. All, just like our own society, they had many different sectors or groups. And the early translations of the New Testament were in Latin, Coptic, Syriac, reflecting the different linguistic and geographic de developments. There was diversity in Corinth. Remember, it's a metropolitan area with all these different things. So it's not surprising that they're, ha they're having all the kinds of exposures we encounter in a modern metropolitan environment. But he goes on here. Now, I love this verse here. This is a verse that Walter Martin used to refer frequently. Verse, 1 Corinthians 11, 19 says, For there must be also heresies among you, that that which are approved may be made manifest among you. Strange perspective. There must be heresies among you that they which are approved may be made manifest. Okay? The true believers, uh, tested by spiritual warfare, should cut themselves off from societies that are inimical to the gospel, is what he's suggesting. But Walter used to use this vo uh, verse to support another perspective he had. It's interesting to notice that when you find certain leaders that have followings, that there isn't any one leader that has it all right on all points. You know, some reader, leaders are strong in prophecy, others here, there. They all have their different strengths. But it's interesting that in general, you can't find a, one of the more accepted leaders in which you agree with everything. And uh, I, that used to surprise me. And Walter used to ar use this verse to justify that. Is that there must be he also heresies among you, so that which is approved may be made manifest. His, he saw this verse saying, you always want to look to Christ, not the leader. There are views I hold that, are, that may be wrong. You shouldn't be looking to me to get your views to agree. You may want to know my views as a help to your own study, but your conclusion should be your own by study. And my expressing my perspectives are intended to help you study, not to sell you a particular perspective. And we tried very hard in our materials to emphasize that. That uh, I, I will tell you what I believe and I'll explain why I believe that. But I don't want you to believe that because I do. I want you to believe whatever you believe by your own study. Our dream here at KI is to strengthen you so that you are capable of finding your own way through the Bible. And to do that with a high hermeneutic, that is to take the Bible seriously, infallibly, in the originals and so on. So we really are here to sell a hermeneutic, a theory of interpretation, not a particular perspective. Yes, we're premillennial for a lot of reasons. Yes, we're pre-trib for some other specialized reasons. But a lot of our people are not necessarily pre-trib. That's fine too. But we, we are because we believe that, but that's not we're not here to sell that point of view. We're here to help you find your way in the scripture. It's our belief that the more the higher your hermeneutic is, the more you'll be drawn in that direction. But that's not our point. The point is to equip you to come to your own conclusions. And this verse, I remember Walter using that, and I thought that was very interesting. Well, we move on. Verse 20. When ye come together, therefore, into one place, this is not to eat the Lord's Supper. And uh, they had these agape feasts and acts and so forth. They were hallmarks of the early church. But they weren't what they should have been, is the point. It says, for in eating... Everyone taketh before the other his own supper, and one is hungry and another is drunken. See, he's not, com he's not upset about the meetings, the way they act in the meetings. They're not conducting themselves in a proper way. And they uh, quickly degenerate into discriminatory and unsavory demonstrations. They didn't walk the talk during their, their, their meals. The rich arriving earlier finished the best, if not all, often satiated and drunk, with slaves and laborers arriving late and going hungry. So Paul is saying that's no way to behave. 
He's not against them having the feast. He's against them the way they're acting in the feast. So he continues verse 22. What? Have ye not houses to eat and to drink in? And despise ye the church of God and shame them that have not? What shall I say unto you? Shall I praise you in this? I praise you not. See, he's scolding them. Okay. He's not scolding him as vigorously as he does his readers in Hebrews, but that's a, another story. Now, see, you need to realize that some very prominent people were members of that church. The Roman proconsul, Sergius Paulus in Cyprus, Luke tells us, was there. The merchant Lydia from Thyatira, uh, Titus Justus in Corinth. These are prominent people that Luke records as being members in Corinth. So the Corinth, Corinthian church was a very prominent place and yet behaving terribly. The excavations in ancient Corinth, by the way, show dining rooms that could accommodate typically 20 to 30 people, and the rest would have to stand in the atrium or the car courtyard. And first comers, friends of the host, were likely to enjoy the, the uh, dining rooms, uh, the triclinium, but the best food leaving the residue for the latecomers. The rich were despising the church by humiliating the poor. And that's obviously inappropriate. He continues, for I have received, get this now, this is important. For I have received of the Lord that which I also I delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread and so forth. This sounds familiar to you, I'm sure, because many, many pastors will open their Lord's Supper from this, from 1123, from this verse on, to use it as a summary of the Lord's Supper. That's why this may sound very familiar to you, because this is very frequently read. But there's a few things here I want to point out. Says, Paul says, for I have received of the Lord. That's pretty provocative. I have received of the Lord. Jesus communicated to Paul directly on several occasions, by the way. That may surprise you. We don't think of Paul as being pretty. No, yes, he was. On the road to Damascus, of course. Remember that. In Arabia, he was there, what, three years? And then in three years in Tarsus, before Barnabas had come to Antioch. So he had personal tutoring by the Lord Jesus Christ. It says, for I have received of the Lord that which also I delivered unto you. So he got this directly from, he didn't copy it from the Gospels, he got it directly from Jesus, is the point he's making here. Okay. Now, there's another issue here. He says, that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, it says, right? It's in the imperfect tense. While being betrayed... The night in which he was betrayed. No, it's not, was, it's not past tense. That's the way it's translated. The subtle error of the translation. The same night in which, while being betrayed, while he was administering the Lord's Supper, he was being betrayed at the same time. That's the, the, you pick that up. It's a subtlety, but important. The Greek word is in the imperfect tense. The deed was in progress at that time on the very threshold of his coming ordeal. It was already, the whole thing had already started, and he's administering the Lord's Supper here. And when he had given thanks, he always says that first, he break it and said, Take eat, this is my body, which is broken for you, this do in remembrance of me. Now the accounts of Luke 22 and Mac 26 and Mark 14 are virtually identical here. Essentially the same. But this epistle may be the earliest, strangely enough. Okay? And when he had given thanks, he always gave thanks before eating. That's one of the reasons we generally try to observe that ourselves. Okay? He says, this is my body. Now it happens that that in the Greek is a neuter term, not masculine, which it would have been if it was referring to the bread. When he says, this is my body, he's referring to his body, not the bread. It represents his body. Uh, the, the, the bread represents the body, but his focus is, is on the body, not the bread. That's a subtlety in the Greek that's not clear in the English. Are you with me so far? Okay. Now, there are all kinds of concepts that we find in, in uh, churches that conf tries to confuse this. One is called transubstantiation. That's a dogma from the Roman Catholic Church, and some Christian churches still have it. The view that the bread and wine actually change in substance, though not in appearance, into his body and blood. They actually think it changes to blood and, and, and that's, what they, that's what they mean by trans. 
There's a variation of that. This was first called, by the way, transubstantiation in the 12th century. So over a thousand years have gone by when they start doing this. Elaborated by theologians in the 13th, 15th century and incorporated the documents at the Council of Trent. There's a variation of that, particularly among the Lutherans, called consubstantiation. It's a variant view in which Christ's body and blood substantially coexist with the consecrated bread and wine. It's a, it's a sort of a middle ground they're trying to... So they don't want to be guilty of transubstantiation, but they haven't really let it go either. They often is associated with Lutheran doctrine. But the point you need to understand, don't bother with either one of those. I want you to be aware of them for the terms, but they're both wrong. Why? Because he was still in the body when he administered that. He's not talking about his, it represents his body. This is my body. He's pointing to his body, not the bread. It's a, it's, a, it's a metaphor he's using. And he instituted the sacrament given for you. He's speaking prophetically. It's going to be given hours away yet. Okay, and Romans 5 deals with a lot of it too. So I'm going to, as we go forward here and explore the Lord's Supper, I'm going to give you seven things to ingest as we go. At the end of the seven, I'll give you a summary of them, but I'm going to challenge you to make your own explanation for each of the seven. You follow me? As I'll point out at the end, a pilot never takes off an airplane or lands an airplane without a checklist. And I'm going to suggest that you don't take the Lord's Supper without using a checklist. It may be in your mind, but make your own checklist because you're playing around with something that's really, really serious. The first is a, it's a divine command. Let's understand that the Lord's Supper is a divine command. That means it's a solemn obligation to assemble with the people of God for the celebration of the memorial of the death of Christ in the Lord's Supper. It's to neglect to do so. is to be disobedient to the Lord's direct wish. If you don't uh, undertake this, you are being disobedient to His direct charge. This do in remembrance of me, that's, that's not a suggestion. It's a command. If you raise the objection that you are not worthy, I suggest that the only ones who have the right to come are those who really believe and confess that they are unworthy. You with me so far? Okay. So, the second one, let's realize that this is a sacred privilege. The table is the Lord's. He's the host. We, look who we are. We who murdered him, who reviled him, and by our sins spit upon him, and drove the cruel nails through his blessed hands, we are invited to come and sit at this table with him as our host, and feast with him by his grace. What a privilege that is. That goes beyond words. And what an insult it is if we refuse that invitation. The table is for His people and not for the world. It's for His people. It's not for strangers. It's not for guests that might be staying at your home this weekend. No, no, no. It's for believers only. It's dangerous if they're not. Okay. The third one. It's a necessary memorial. This reminds us of the infinite cost of our purchased salvation. You were bought, purchased. And this gives us a glimpse as to the price of that purchase. It's His faithfulness, not ours, that saves us. It's not our faith that saves us. It's His faith that saves us. And that's what this commemorates. Remember verse 25. And after the same manner also he took the cup. And when he had supped, saying, This cup is the New Testament. This cup is the New Testament in my blood. Not the blood. This cup is the Testament in my blood. This do ye as oft as ye drink it in remembrance of me. Okay? This cup. This cup is the New Testament. It's the third cup of the four, by the way. All four cups have a name, and they're, they're named out of Exodus 6. I won't go into that here. 
But uh, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. It's not the blood itself, it's the cup. It's the, it's the institution that he's doing there. And uh, the, in, the, in the translation here, it's the co at the cost or the price of. At the cost of the price of the blood. The covenant comes at the cost of the price of that blood. And so, uh, and this is a place where if you want to put in your notes, you can, your notes on chapter 5 that we had before uh, regarding Passover, all, where all the leaven is supposed to be removed and so forth. And uh, uh, we can, uh, this is a good place to expand on that, but I won't take the time here. The Mishnah says, it's interesting, in the Hebrew commentaries, they make note that the wine they serve at Passover is mixed with water. They don't know why. There are rabbinical documents where they speculate as to why do we put water in the wine. The answer to that happens to be in John 19. When the, when the centurion drives his spear and out comes blood and water. From that event, there are articles in the American Medical Journal's article as to the cause of death. It's actually a very, very key p fact that comes out of that. And they don't know, that there isn't anything in their, their preparation Passover anticipates that, but they don't know why. When you read John 19, verse 34, you understand why. I think that's provocative. The Passover lamb is his body. And by the, the Haggadah that you usually use at, at Passover, it means the showing forth. It's what the very word means. And we apply this. Where do, we, where do we apply the blood? We apply it to the doorposts of our heart. We apply it to the doorposts of our heart. Just like in Exodus, they applied it to their doorposts. And by the way, the, uncircum the uncircumcised could not participate. And here we're talking about the people whose heart's not circumcised. And that's, there's plenty of verses on that. Jesus was made sin for us. In 2 Corinthians 5.21, is a verse that's absolutely staggering. You and I do not have the capacity to imagine what a holy, the holy son of God, who was sinless, how he was made sin for us. We had, do not have the capacity to imagine it. We know he did because it's there, but wow. And uh, I am the bread of life, he says. I, and and, and, and Solomon gives us a prophecy in the first four verses of Proverbs that most people miss because it's not translated properly. But God arrives to be consumed. If you have our commentary on Proverbs, you'll know what I'm talking about there. That God arrives to be consumed. Yes, that's all in John 6. And, uh, and manna, the whole idea of manna, you know, is, it was, it's always called by bread in the Word of God. But again, it's, it echoes this. It frees us from the old life, the bondage. It's a call to separation as Paul emphasizes in Ephesians 4, and so forth. But there's another side of this I w I'd like to pick up, and this is something that may really shock you and surprise you. And this, this chain of bread and wine, when did it start? It didn't start in the upper room that night uh, uh, before Gethsemane. No, no. Back in Genesis 14, Abraham encounters, he has a huge military victory, and he ends up giving tithes to a guy by the name of Melchizedek, who is a king and a priest. He's a king and a priest before Abraham was even, any of that was going on. So, Melchizedek, okay. A little verse in Genesis 14, which would disappear into obscurity, except when you get to Psalm 110, it is not only celebrated in Psalm 110, that psalm is echoed 25 times in the New Testament, more than probably any other psalm. In the, in the Psalms. And that would probably not mean a lot, except Paul spends three chapters in the Epistle to Hebrews, 5, 6, and 7, hammering the uniqueness of this guy Melchizedek. He's a king and a priest before Abraham. Abraham gives him tithes. And the writer to Hebrews makes a, a, a big deal of that. We need to understand that because there's only three people who are kings and priests. In the Jewish model, we have Judah, the royal tribe, and we have Levi, the priestly tribe, always separate. They were not to crisscross. When they tried, it caused problems, serious problems. But that separation is celebrated throughout the Jewish scriptures. But Jesus is, has an oath of God that he's, he, uh, he's a, a king and a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. So there's Melchizedek, 
the Messiah himself, and there's a third group, his redeemed, that are kings and priests, as certified in Revelation chapter 5. And you can dig that out on your own. It's this whole idea echoes in Genesis 40. When Joseph's in prison and he gives these, this counsel to these two guys that are there in prison with him. Remember that? One's a baker and one's a wine steward. They both have dreams. The dreams are a little different, but they're each a three-day thing. And uh, the, the, wine, the, the baker, after the third day, is executed. The dream, that's what he predicted from the dream, and that's what happened. The wine steward, after three days, was made free. And he promised to remember Joseph, but he didn't until much later. And he recalls Joseph as having this gift, and that's what, of course, leads to the whole drama of Joseph. But again, we have the wine and the bread echoed in advance in that... In that uh, and, and again, the three days is an issue I won't get into here. It's interesting that this, in, the, in the Lord's Supper, there are four cups. First, it's the third cup that... Jesus uses the cup of, ble cup of blessing, it's the third of the four, that he institutes the Lord's Supper. Do you realize that in the upper room, they didn't finish? They never touched the fourth cup. When you get to the fourth cup, Jesus says, I will not drink of wine until we're all together in the Father's house. So the fourth cup will be drunk when we are all with him in the Father's house. Which, by the way, closes a parenthesis from Melchizedek in Genesis 14 until the fourth cup in the Father's house. Is the, that, that parenthesis embraces the whole Jewish drama that we study in the Bible. It starts with the call of Abraham and it finishes with the second coming. It's almost like a parenthesis around that in which the Melchizedek model starts before and go, continues through eternity. Many people don't realize that the mystery of Melchizedek. I encourage you to take a look at that. So the seventh thing, the fourth thing is a willing testimony. We need to consecrate ourselves to His will, not ours, His. Okay? And there's one loaf of bread. To properly give you have one loaf of bread that's divided among the group. That signifies to all who participate, they partake of the one body of Christ to form a covenant community. We are His covenant partners. That's the whole idea that uh, underlies all this. When Moses confirmed the first covenant in Mount Sinai, he sprinkled blood on the people and said, this is the blood of the covenant that the Lord has made with you. That's in Exodus 24. The animal blood was sprinkled for the first covenant. Jesus' blood was spilled for the second covenant. That's why we call it the Old, the first, the Old, the Old Testament, New Testament. The Old Testament is equivalent to covenant. So... The new covenant made the first one obsolete, we know from, from Hebrews 8. He ratified this new covenant with Christ's blood, shed once and for all. And Hebrews hammers this, the whole epistle of Hebrews builds to that crescendo. And God appointed Jesus as the mediator of that covenant. So okay, we have a, the next one is a humbling confession. We're, now we're down to verse 25. After the same manner also he took the cup, and when he had supped, saying, The cup is the New Testament in my blood. This do ye oft as ye drink it in remembrance of me. Okay? It's a memorial only for imperfect people. Perfect people would have no need for this memorial. Our identification with him also involves our humbling confession of our own helplessness and unworthiness as well. Away go all excuses in all my own good works, whatever they might be, nonsense. The death of Christ is the death of all man's righteousness. I hereby declare myself to be completely unfit in myself. That's the, that's, that, that's the declaration it involves. My, remember how the song, my hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I would not trust the sweetest frame, but lean, only lean on Jesus' name. Was it for crimes that I had done? He groaned upon that tree. Amazing pity, grace unknown, and love beyond degree. Seven things. Okay, the sixth one is an act of faith. Just as I am without one plea, but that my, thy blood was shed for me, and that thou bidst me come to thee, O Lamb of God, I come, I come. 
That's the lamb. For as often as ye eat this bread and drink this cup, ye do show the Lord's death till he come. Notice this. For as often as ye eat this bread and drink this cup, ye do show the Lord's death until he come. When did that first happen? I personally suspect that happened in Genesis 14 when Melchizedek administered blood, uh, uh, bread and wine to Abraham. He was foreshadowing God's whole program of redemption. And I, 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 I challenge you to think that through. I think, think that through. This is eschatological. Our personal relationship and destiny with him is at view here. And I don't think it began in 1 Corinthians 11.26. It began in Genesis 14. The Lord's table is found in only four books in the New Testament. The second coming is 23 books and so forth. See, the Lord's Supper looks back, not only backward to the cross, it looks forward to the crown as well. They're both in view here. It is a memorial only for the time of his absence. When he comes, the supper will be supplanted by the marriage supper of the Lamb. When the Lord Jesus left the Last Supper with his disciples, what did he do? He went out to die for them. The disciples went out, one to betray him, others to be prayerless and forgetful, and all, to, all of them to desert him. They all deserted him. Often we have broken this bread together around the Lord's table, and, and then we've gone out to do just what those disciples did. We've denied him. So the seventh one, the last of the seven, is a solemn warning. Listen to what Paul says here. Wherefore, whosoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord unworthily shall be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. Ouch! Think that. Listen to what he's saying. If you drink this cup of the Lord unworthily, you shall be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. Wow! See, this sentence is clear in the Greek but it's not clear in the English. It means that the nonchalant, the profaning partaker of the Lord's Supper is guilty of murdering Jesus. You've got to be kidding. No. See, the key is this word unworthily is an adverb, not an adjective. It's an adverb, not an adjective. It doesn't say unworthy, unworthily. It's describing the verb, the action. And that's you're guilty of murdering Jesus. Wow. Christians should never regard the celebration as a mere ritual. Not frivolous or careless, but focused and committed. Heavy stuff here, gang. Those who profane the elements are guilty of the body and blood of our Lord, putting the Son of God to open shame and to treat Him with insolence. Wow. Wow. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of the bread and drink of the cup. So you examine yourself, not the bread. Examine yourself. Self-examination is essential, never with contempt or frivolity. Never with unbelief or disobedience. And by the way, all of this does not accord with theories like transubstantiation. The bread remains bread at the moment of reception. It's still bread. It's the, not the bread you're examining, it's your life that you're examining. For he that eateth and drinketh unworthily, eateth and drinketh damnation to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. Whew. Boy, heavy stuff here. Failure to submit to self-examination results in God's subsequent judgment. The guest at the Lord's table must be blameless, righteous, truthful, Morally upright and obedient to God's law. And the only way you can prepare for that is to be washed in a Christian's bar of soap. 1 John 1 9. If you don't, measure, if you don't memorize any other verses, you dig out 1 John 1 9 and memorize it. It's going to be your most precious uh, uh, remedy to all of this.
Now there's a stress in the corporate nature of the verse and responsibility to each for, to all. It's one loaf and one body we're dealing with here. And for this cause, get this, for this cause many are weak and sickly among you and many sleep. Paul is saying many are you not only sick, you died for not obeying all this. Who said that? Paul did. Spiritual ills can have physical results. And we're talking about divine healing, not faith healing. It's His sovereignty, not our initiatives. James 5 is, James 5 is often misconstrued. It applies to those particular cases of sickness which are due to unconfessed and unjudged sin. Ignorance of the will of God causes much sorrow in the life of the believer. Ignorance of the will of God causes much sorrow in the life of the believer. Hosea said the same thing, my people are destroyed because of the lack of knowledge. The issues in this chapter probably started from the beginning, all the way through. It, for if we would judge ourselves, we should not be judged. We must self-examine ourselves, not become self-appointed judge of others. Remember Job and his th three friends, as they're called. With friends like that, you don't need enemies. But when we are judged, we are chastened of the Lord, that we should not be condemned with the world. And we're distinguishing here, diacrino, Distinguishing that which we are and what we ought to be, so that we not come under judgment. Crino. Wherefore, my brethren, when ye come together to eat, tarry one for another. Spiritual rather than physical nourishment. That's why you come together. And if any man hunger, let him eat at home, that you come not together unto condemnation. And the rest, <laughs> there's more to be said, but the rest I will set in order when I come. He's trying to deal with these... Um, very confused of the chaos that they call the churches. So you got, here's your summary for the evening, my friends. Seven things to ingest. And I want you to, in your notes, organize your comments on each of them in your own words. The first is a divine command. Second is a blessed privilege. The third is a necessary memorial. The fourth is a willing testimony. The fifth is a humbling confession. The sixth is an act of faith. And the seventh is a solemn warning. And I encourage you to fill in that outline with your own words from your own study. And have that as something you review before you take the Lord's uh, thing. Just like a pilot, don't take off or landing without a checklist. And you make your own checklist. Don't take mine. Take your own. And with that, let's close for a word of prayer.